how's everybody doing today? It is good to see you. My name's Jim. If you're new here, I'm the lead pastor here. I'd like to welcome those that are joining us online as well. Well, yesterday we survived a crazy day. Probably the craziest day in our church history. <laughs> and I was thinking about this, that, you know, Jesus, when he fed the crowds, you know, he used loaves, you know, and fish, and we did hot dogs and candy. A little different, right? But we, we're guessing, we, it was easily over 2,000 people came through our trunk or treat harvest party yesterday because I made four trips to Kroger to buy candy. And, 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 I, and I know there was over 2,000 pieces of candy out of those four trips, and, and it was just crazy. But I just want to say thank you for all of you that just helped make it possible, your generosity, your serving. I know people's feet and backs were hurting yesterday, and, and you just endured through it just to keep loving on, on people. And so it was, it was a great day. And I know some are staying home watching online because they're exhausted. And so I didn't prep anything for today because I was just so exhausted. <laughs> so we're in this series we started last week as we're just kind of taking some time just to go through some of God's promises. And as I shared with you guys last week, I think it's just a important time um, for us, in, in light of this crazy election that's coming up, election years are always crazy, and, and it's just always good just to be reminded of who our Savior is, and be reminded of what God's Word tells us, and that our anchor is in Christ, and in His Word, the promises of, of God, that's where our hope is, not in one person that will run our, our nation, however that goes. But our hope is in God. So it's always good just to be reminded of his promises. And today we're going to be looking at just the promises of just God's promise of answered prayer. Now, now how many of you experienced God answering prayers when you prayed? I'm sure that if not all of us have experienced at some point in time, just the move, the hand of God. And it's just, it's just good to be reminded of this because there's a lot in Scripture that God has to say about prayer. Matter of fact, the amazing thing about God's word and just the fact that Jesus came, we celebrate Christmas, it's coming, through the incarnation, being fully God, taking on humanity, being fully God and fully man, becoming our, just being our savior to come and save us from our sin. It's just that God is crazy about us. He loves us. We are the focus of all creation. That mankind was created in his image and God wants us to know him. He wants us to be in relationship with him, and he wants us to communicate with him and talk with him and commune with him. And so throughout Scripture, God's Word, we, we have this constant invitation where, where God is doing the inviting, where he's inviting us to connect with him. And so I've shared with you a couple of weeks ago just one of God's promises, and we're going to put this first verse up here, Jeremiah 33.3. And I learned this years ago in college as God's phone number. And it's a great verse to memorize, a great reference. All you got to remember is Jeremiah 33, 3. And the significance of this, this passage is this was written during a national crisis. God's people were a mess. The northern kingdom had already been destroyed by the Assyrians. And then God raises up the Babylonians that takes out the southern kingdom of Judah, talking about the people of God, the the Jewish people over in Israel, right, takes out this the southern kingdom of Judah. The kings were rebellious towards God. They didn't want to listen to the prophets, and God's sending this guy, Jeremiah, to speak to the king. They don't like what he has to say, so they throw him in a pit. And and one of these other prophets rescues him, and they end up letting him him live. But during the, this time of national crisis, God speaks to his people, and he cries out to them. He gives them this incredible invitation. He says, call to me, and I will answer you. Now, that's a great promise right there. God says, call to me. I want you to call to me. Even in the midst of pain, even in the midst of uh, when, when things are going well, when things aren't going well, he says, call to me. It's this incredible invitation, and I will answer you. And there's this, this picture where he says, I will tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. That God wants to reveal to us himself and the things of his kingdom. The God of all creation, the author of life. Right? He says, come, call to me, and, and I will answer you. 
And so we have this incredible invitation that God gives us. And we see this picture in Scripture that that heaven is locked up, that God's longing to, to bring of his kingdom, but yet heaven's locked up because God's people aren't praying. They're not answering the invitation. They're not responding to him. They're not crying out to him. Like, you know, it's like, it's like prayer is like that, that last-ditch effort sometimes, yes. unfortunately, right? It's like we, we try in our own strength until it's like, okay, we finally surrender. It's like, okay, God, help me. Well, well, God wants us to go before him right at the beginning of it all, that he wants us to respond to this invitation. And so, so heaven's locked up. We see a great example of this. So when, when Solomon, the, the, one of the, the kings of Israel, the third king of Israel, Solomon... King David's son, God uses him to build this magnificent temple. I mean, Solomon's the most wise person, and his, his leadership is just impeccable. The beginning of, of his, God, his anointing and his ministry as being the king over his people, and this is incredible temple, and he's dedicating it before God. And God speaks to his people during this time, and this is this, this word that he gives us when it comes to prayer, Second Chronicles 7.14. He says, if my people who are called by my name. Now in Christ, that's us. We are God's people, right? He says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and what? And pray and seek after him and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Not every nation on the planet longs for this, for their land to be healed, for their land to be restored. And it's this invitation that God, he gave Solomon, right? And later on gives Jeremiah, he says, if you would just pray and humble yourselves and seek my face, I want to move. I want to bring my kingdom. I want to bring its power to bring change, help to the hurting and the broken, the poor and the needy. And those, even those that are wealthy, right, to, to come and minister to, to us, the focus of his creation, if we just simply would humble ourselves and seek his face and pray. Matter of fact, this coming Wednesday, it'll be announced here in a moment, but this coming Wednesday, we're having a night of prayer and worship because we think it's important, right? In light of the election that's coming, in light of what God wants to do, and not just for who's going to be our representatives and congressmen and our president, but for the church, the church throughout our land, that we would rise up. We would start on our knees, right? Humble ourselves and seek God's face and pray, and that God would use his church to change the world with the good news of Christ. That's what the gospel is, the good news, right? And so, so God gives us this invitation that he calls to us that we would in return call to him. Now, I'm of the age where I didn't have a cell phone when I was a kid growing up, you know, to where my parents could text me. So what my mom would do, if we were out playing in the neighborhood, and as a kid, and some of you can probably relate to this, they're around my my age, I'm 20, anyway, they're around my age, so so as a kid, when you're out in the backyard, you're out playing in the neighborhood, you had better always be in earshot, right? And my mom would step out in the backyard, and she would yell. My brother's name was John, I'm Jim, right? But it was Johnny and Jimmy, right? And she's yelling, Johnny! Jimmy, time for dinner. Anybody else have that happen? You know, it's like so embarrassing, right? So humiliating. But it happened every day we were outside playing. And you had better hear her calling. Because if you didn't, and you didn't make it home for dinner, you didn't get dinner. (laughs) It was not pretty, right? You went straight to bed, right? I mean, there was just like, there were consequences, right? And it's like, but, but she worked hard to make this incredible dinner for us. So we wanted to come home, right? And it's the same thing with God. He, he's got this invitation. He says, I'm calling, come, come to me. And he, says, and he says, call back to respond back. And we had better respond, coming, right? You know what I'm talking about? And we would come home and we would have this feast together. It's the same picture we see in Scripture. God invites us in, and it's just this promise. So we get to the New Testament when Christ our Savior, Jesus, comes on the scene, 
Jesus tells us this. It's in the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon ever recorded by his followers that are there. Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 and 8. Jesus says these words. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. So there's this invitation. Jesus saying, ask. Keep asking. Keep seeking. Keep knocking. Because he wants to reveal to us himself the things of his kingdom. Verse 8 says, for everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So we got this, this incredible promise that we see throughout the word of God. That God wants us to call out to him. To talk with him. Communicate with him. Commune with him. So that he can answer. And so I'm just going to give you a bullet point here, and we're going to kind of go into some, some simple little practical things when it comes to prayer. So prayer, what it does is it unlocks heaven and brings the power and the presence of God to earth. In just a few moments, we're going to go through the Lord's Prayer together, right? And that's, that's the significance of the Lord's Prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, right? Your will be done here. And God's waiting for us to call to him so that he can come and bring that of his kingdom here in our midst and, and through us. So prayer unlocks heaven. It, it connects with God, and God works in us and through us to change us and to change the world around us. So today what I'm going to look at, we're going to look at five keys to unlock the promise of answered prayer. Because I think the place where we all get kind of tripped up sometimes, I'm just going to throw this question out there. Does God answer every prayer? Yes. <laughs> See, it's a trick question. You're like, uh, 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 yes. We'll just say yes, according to Scripture. But we're going to look at it, and sometimes, though, it's not the answer we want. Or it's not answered the way we want it to. And so these are key things. So we're going to keep this really simple, probably have some fun here. So just the first key to unlocking this whole thing with prayer and God answering our prayers, is it, we see in scripture that if the request is wrong, God will say no. Now, we learn that as kids, right? But then we, we get confused, like, so why is God that way? We, we learn it as kids, right? Because as parents, our kids sometimes, they're, they're very selfish, right? They, they want the wrong things. They want things they think they should have that they're not ready for or that they don't really need, right? And so it doesn't take very long, anybody that's been a parent and had a kid, that one of the first words a kid learns is no. 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 Where did they learn it from? Mom. They learned it from us, right? Because we keep saying no, 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 no. It's like, and then just sometimes kids are like, do they ever say yes? <laughs> no. <laughs> And we say yes when the question is right, right? But, but when the request is wrong, God will say no, right? So let's just look at some verses here. James, this is Jesus' brother, wrote the book of James. And he tells us this, says, you do not have, first off, because you don't even ask. Now that's pretty sad that James had to write that in a letter to circulate to the churches. You don't have because you're not even asking when we see throughout scriptures this great promise, God says, call to me and I will answer you. Jesus says, ask, seek, knock. Right? He says, you don't have because you don't even ask God. And then, verse 3, he says, then when you finally get around to asking, he says, you don't receive because you're asking with the wrong motives. Your, your heart's not in the right place. Right? You're, you're kind of going about this in a very self-focused way and that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, the thing we have to understand is that God wants us to enjoy this life. He's given us things for pleasure. But the thing is, is this is a very self-focused motive that's just to benefit us. And it's, and it's a wrong motive is what James is telling us. And so there's times when the answer is no because we're focused on ourselves. Right? And, and, it's, and it's hard to understand why things are, are a no, right? So, so what's challenging sometimes in life is, I, I remember years ago, I had this old van. It was a Plymouth Voyager. And, and the, the tire, remember, it was on the, the passenger side. The front tire just kept going bald on the outside. So I'm so cheap that I just had to rotate it to the other side. 
Well, then the one I had rotated to the other side started going bald, so I had him rotate it to the back. Well, the one that was on the back got moved to the front, then, then that one started going bald. You see where this is going? This is, this is how cheap I, I, I was, you know? And then over time, you know, the, the guy in the shop says, look, if you just got your vehicle aligned, your tires wouldn't be going bald. But that cost money to get an alignment, right? And I was too cheap to pay for the alignment. So just kind of a simple little bullet point just to help us understand is that God says no when we are not in alignment with his plans and his purposes. And we can keep trying as kids do, right? And we just keep trying to twist. And so, so what happens is usually the kid will go to mom first. And then if mom doesn't work, then they go to dad and you know, if it don't get if, da, if it don't work with that, it ain't gonna work. Period. Right? And they try to play us, right? And it, but it's when we're not in alignment with God, and our prayers, and the things we're asking for, then the answer will always be no, because sometimes our requests are very selfish, right? So when it comes to answer prayer, God is answering. It's just the answer is no, right? Second key when it comes to prayer, just the promise of God's answering our prayers. Is it if the timing is off, God will say, whoa, just slow down, right? Now, we live in a culture where we want everything now, right? I mean, unfortunately, microwaves have been around for a long time. Fast food's now been around for a long time. But then we got this technology where we got all, all these devices. And, and it's like, you know, when I was in college, we didn't even have computers, that's how old I am, right? We didn't even have computers at the beginning of my college career. And then they started introducing these things called computer labs. There was no Microsoft Word. <laughs> it was some program called WordStar and WordPerfect. And they were and it was like you're and it's like it was just really slow, but we expected it to be slow. If we had that today, we would be going crazy. Right? And there was all these 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 GIFs and Jiffy's made where people in little videos where people were taking their keyboard and smacking their monitor because it just wasn't responding the way we needed it to. Right now we carry them around in our pockets. Right? And everything is so quick and so fast. We can know what's happening around the world instantly almost. It's crazy. Right? And so we expect things to happen now. Right? And God's often saying, slow down, just wait, the timing isn't right. We see this in the book of Acts. Right? After Jesus pays his pri the price, you know, gives his life on the cross, and three days later he's risen from the dead, right? Yep. He had power over death and over the grave, right? So he conquers sin and death for us. And then he meets with his disciples, and they're just, they're rearing to go. They're like, man, Jesus is alive. Let's do this. Let's change the world. Let's go do this. And Jesus is saying, whoa, 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 slow down. All in due time, right? So in Acts chapter 1, verse 4, it says, On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem. I know you guys are gearing ready to go. Do not leave Jerusalem, but four-letter word we all hate. Wait. You know, it's funny. This morning, I'm not kidding. I got up, I hardly slept last night. I got up early, and I got here like 7 o'clock this morning, and I'm coming across Stop 18. It's pitch black outside. There's only a few cars on the road. Some guy's like on my bumper. I mean, like, I, when, when you can't see somebody's headlights, you know they're too close. Yeah. I, I was praying because I came so close to having him just eat my bumper because he was all the way on my bumper. I was like, dude. And I'm always thinking when I'm out driving, what is the big hurry? We're always in a hurry. We got to get somewhere. We got to get somewhere. And then he turns into a neighbor. It's like, really? He just had to, couldn't slow down, right? We just were so impatient. But he says, wait. And many times God says, wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. And he's talking about the promise of the Holy Spirit, that God didn't want us to be out there doing the mission and the ministry of the kingdom and our own power and our own strength, but under the power and the leadership of the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. So there's times when God says, wait, just slow down. But we're always in a hurry. Years ago, I remember we, my wife and I, we went to a, a conference out in California. And, and we, were at the, we were the coming back home. We were at the Ontario airport. And, you know, the thing you just dread about air, airline flights is you go and you get into the airplane. And, you know, things filling up. 
And you're just sitting there. And it's like, what is happening? This thing's not even running. You know, can we just turn the air off for like a half hour here? No, you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, you're like oh, I'm just kidding. It's like, it's like if the air is out, you're like, oh my gosh, it's getting so stuffy in here. And everybody's like getting impatient. People are getting up and moving around. It's like, man, what's like, you're looking at your watch and you're thinking, man, I got a connecting flight. We got to get, get out of here. And it's like a half hour goes by. And we're not even pulled out of the tarmac. We're still connected. And then finally the pilot comes on. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for flying our, you know, this flight. It says, today we are, we're experiencing just some mechanical things that we're, we're working on. We should be leaving within the next 15 to 20 minutes. Please be patient. Right? Thinking, take your time. <laughs> Hurry up. Take your time. And then, but I'm sitting there thinking, do we need to get on another plane? <laughs> right? So finally, you know, take off. We're in the air. And we're sitting there just calculating, looking at our watches. It's like, okay, we're barely going to make it to our connecting flight, which was in Dallas, which is no small airport, right? And we know we're going to be running to get to our connecting flight. And so we're, you know, we get to, you know, the airspace over Dallas. And we're going around. And we're going around. And, you know, it's like, Oh my gosh, we got to make that connecting flight, right? Because we got to get home, right? We're in this mad rush to get home. And then once again, uh, this is your uh, pilot speaking. Just uh, want to let you know that we are exercising the landing gear right now. We just got a little bit of a hang up, but we, things seem to be working, working fine. Just give us another couple times around and we'll be landing. <laughs> and I'm sitting there thinking, take your time, buddy. Take your time. I would rather be Jim Teller that's late than the late Jim Teller, right? So take your time. We can wait to land this plane. But sometimes we are in such a hurry. And there's so many times when it comes to praying, God says, wait. Now let's take a look at examples of what happens when we don't wait. It's a great example in the Old Testament. The very first king of Israel King Saul. Saul started out really well. I mean, he experienced the power, the move of God on his life, right? And he starts leading God's people. You know, there's, there's, there's all this, this war going on with these Philistines, and he's just having great success. And there's this prophet by the name of Samuel. And then Samuel, one day, Samuel comes to him and says, hey, I'm going to be coming at a certain time Wait for me, because what Samuel, he was both a prophet and a priest, and he would come and he would perform the sacrifice, and he would inquire of God what God wanted them to do, whether they were to go to war or not. And Saul was waiting. And, you know, it's like, it's like God's timing. It's like, you know, the, the clock hits noon, and it's like, where is Samuel and Saul's getting impatient, and Saul sees the enemy troops. They're getting restless, and they're starting to move. He sees that his troops are getting restless. And it's still noon, but it's not noon in 10 seconds. It's noon in like 55 seconds, right? And so I'm, there's not really a time set, but it's, it's like I'm giving you an example, right? And, and Saul just finally says, okay, give me the sacrifice. And he performs the sacrifice, which was not his position to do. And so this whole story unpacks. And then Sam, Samuel shows up right on God's time, right? And Samuel says to him, Samuel said here, this is in, in Second Sam, 1 Samuel 13, Samuel said, what on earth are you doing? What are you doing? And Saul answered, well, when I saw I was losing my army from under me and that you hadn't come when you said you would and that the Philistines were poised at Michmash, right? So there's this place, they're ready, they're ready to go, we're ready to go to battle. And I said, the Philistines are about to come down on me in Gilgal and I haven't yet come before God asking for his help. So I took things into my own hands, right? And this is what we do, right? It's like, where are you, God? Where are you, God? We just take matters into our own hands. And he said, and sacrifice the burnt offering. And Samuel responds, because that was a fool thing to do, Samuel said to Saul. If you had kept the appointment that your God commanded, 
By now, God would have set a firm and lasting foundation under your kingly rule over Israel. As it is, your kingly rule is already falling to pieces, and God is out looking for your replacement right now. Which was then, shortly after that, that Samuel the prophet goes and anoints David to be the next king of Israel. But Saul took things into his own hands because he couldn't wait And he started looking like we all do. We start looking at the circumstances. We see it with the disciples, right? And and just the the storms, right? They're out in the water and a storm comes. We start looking at our circumstances rather than keeping our eyes fixed on God and the person of Jesus Christ and his promises. And so we tend to take matters into our own hands. So sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes the answer is whoa. It's just not the right time. It's not that God's not going to answer it. It's not a no. It's just the timing's not right. And then the third thing we see, third key thing when it comes to answer prayer, is if your relationships are broken, God will say, grow. See, I'm trying to have it rhyme. All right. A little bit funny, right? So, So if our relationships are broken, God will say, grow, because our relationships are so important. You've heard me say this so many times. Those who've been with me for some time. All we have are relationships. Our relationship with God and our relationships with one another. The first and second commandment in Scripture, it's all about relationships. Everything flows out of relationships. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what flows out of this, love your neighbor as yourself. You can't love your neighbor as yourself if you're not in communion with God. It's the outflow of that, right? Life is all about our relationships, starting with God. And God says, if your relationships are broken, he's wanting us to grow so that we can get things right. So when we go back to just in the Gospels and some of the things that Jesus tells us about prayer and answers to prayer, Mark 11, verses 24 and 25, Jesus says this. He says, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Now, we can just pause there for a moment, right? Just think about this verse. Whatever we ask for in prayer, right? We, this is kind of out of context, but in this whole context, but I want you to believe in me. I want you to believe that I'm the God of promise. I'm the God of covenant. I poured out my life on the cross to rescue you, to save you from sin, and the power of death that was over you. And if you just come to me in faith and ask for these things that I want you to call to me, I'm going to answer you in prayer and believe that you received it. It will be yours. But That's not where it stops. The very next verse, which we tend to not look at in the context, is this. Verse 25. And when you stand praying, right? Jesus' expectation is we're going to be praying. If you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. And we see over and over again in Jesus' teaching the the significance and the importance of our relationships. And many times we don't want to make them right. Because we looked at it in the last point, we're just self-focused. We want things on our way and our time. And we get ahead of God and we do things because we're just very selfish. It's kind of like the, the, the epitome of, of sin is that we're just self-focused. And God says, your relationships matter. And I want you to get things right. Matter of fact, let's look at another example. In 1 Peter chapter 3, we just did a whole study on the book of, of 1 Peter. Right? Just living different, living you know, this holy, different, set-apart life. And, and in chapter 3, it talks about just this, what marriage should look like. And this is in the context where the church is under heavy persecution. Right? And so he said, in the same way, so you husband must give honor to your wives. Treat your wife with an understanding as you live together. She may be weaker than you are. And we talked about that, that, that word, weaker, did a whole week Sunday on that. Just talking about just physically, men typically are stronger, bigger body, right? So it's kind of, they're, they're weaker than you. So it's like, don't be, don't be domineering, overpowering, right? Love in the right ways, we're saying. She may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should. Why? So that your prayers will not be hindered. We see over and over again in Scripture. It hinders our prayer when our relationships are broken. And over and over again, God commands us and he calls us to to get our relationships in order. 
And remember we talked about this, I think it was last week, we talked about if at all possible, as it depends on you, right? That's what Paul wrote. It's best if it's at all possible, it depends on you. And sometimes some situations are really hard. We can try and try to make things right. But if the other person isn't receptive, at least we know that we can stand before God and did our part. This is what scripture commands us to. Going back to the book of James, James chapter 5, verse 16. This is an incredible picture of just the power of fellowship. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. That the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. And it's all in the context of relationships. When our relationships are broken, God's going to challenge us. He said, I want you to grow. I'm, I'm not going to open the door. I'm not going to answer this until you get things right with me and get things right with other people. So that's kind of a key thing when it comes to answer prayer. God is answering the prayer, but he's saying grow. All right? Fourth key to this promise of answer prayer is if your faith is low, God will say so. All right, so let's kind of let's kind of kind of look at this. All right, so so when Jesus is out doing ministry, there's this guy whose son is demonized. He's demon possessed, and he, his son he just keeps throwing him into the, the fire, and he's he's hurting. There's a self harm going on, and so this this father in desperation brings his son to his disciples. Right, because Jesus had already commissioned his disciples to go and, and heal the sick and cast out demons. He gave them authority and power to go do this during his time of ministry with them. That's three years. And so they bring his son, and, and they're like, they're trying, they're, they're praying, but nothing's happening. And so they're, they, they're like, so what is going on here? And so they pull, after Jesus comes and sets the son free, then it says in Scripture that the disciples come to him in private and say, so why didn't this work for us when we were praying? And he gives them this answer, Matthew 17, verse 20. He replied, because you have so, see, I had to work it in there, you have so little faith. Don't be laughing at me, Brent. So little faith, right? And so we see this multiple times in the Gospels where Jesus is challenging his disciples he says, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Now, it's not like this, this magic formula that Jesus has given us. But what Jesus is constantly challenging his followers to is, I want you to believe me. I want you to have faith in me. I want you to see that, that I am much bigger and much greater than your circumstances. Then we see the things the Apostle Paul and other other apostles were, you know, those were with Jesus and those that came later, they, these things that they wrote, that all things are possible through Christ who gives us strength and we're just willing to trust and believe Him. And so Jesus is trying to, to help them grow their faith. It's like, why, why can't this happen? Why didn't it happen for us? It's because you, your faith is so little. Now let me give you a little more insight on this. Because I'm going to jump over the Gospel of Mark, the same account that took place. And Mark gives us a little more insight on this specific type of situation when it comes to demonization. I think I put this in there. Mark 9, 29. Did I put that in there? Did I put it there? All right. I'm just going to share it with you. I must have kept it. Okay. Mark 9, 29 says this. So he tells them, he said, this kind, this type of demonization can only take place through prayer and fasting. That there's some times when we've got to just get before God and really get focused. And there's been so many times that throughout my, my years of being a Christ follower, before I was even in ministry, that I've taken windows of life and just got before God and fasted and prayed. Saying, God, what is it that you want? Just trying to get all the clutter, all the noise of everything going on around me. What is it that you are after? What is it that you're wanting me to do? Or as in our marriage, like asking, what are you wanting us to do? And it's just taking these time and just doing fast, like a Daniel fast, where you're just doing vegetables or juice, right? Or just taking a couple days and just fasting from food, period, just drinking water and just coming before God. It's, God, I need to hear. I need clarity. And once again, it's not a magic formula. It's, it's just really helping us to get focused in on God so that we can hear clearly what it is that he has in store for us. 
And so this type of demonization was taking place. You just, you need to pray and you need to fast. You need to get focused so you understand clearly how to deal with this type of situation. And some situations are harder than others. And so, so we see in Scripture that there's times when God's just going to say, so the answer isn't coming because your faith is too small. Let's go back to James. Jesus' brother wrote this, James chapter 1, verse 6. He says, when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Now, why is James challenging us this? I, I think James was thinking about the stories that he heard of the disciples. James, Jesus' brother, didn't believe in his brother. They didn't believe his brother was the, the Savior for a long time until we get, get to the, the church is starting to grow and he sees that Jesus really is who he is. He says, believe and not doubt because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. Now, I think James is thinking about all the stories you heard the disciples talk about of all the times they were out on the Sea of Galilee and those storms would come and they're freaking out. And one moment, they're like, let's go change the world. And then this storm comes, and Jesus, one occasion, Jesus is sleeping. He's exhausted. He's just fed like 5,000 people. And he's like, let's go to the other side. So they get in a boat, and Jesus told them, let's go to the other side. They're the words of God the Son. We are going to the other side. They get halfway. This storm comes, right? And it's just like us in life. The storms come. We lose focus. We think God's asleep. It's like, you, don't you know what's going on? Jesus, wake up. Don't you understand? We're going to die. Water's coming into the boat. And then that situation, just like, why do you have such little faith? Stop looking at the storm. Keep your eyes fixed on me. And so I think James takes this story, says, don't doubt. Because when we doubt, we're like, we're like just the waves. They just keep crashing over. We're just, just tossing and turning and just taking our eyes off Jesus. But I want you to believe in me. Trust me in my word. Trust in my promises. Because the promises of God are trustworthy and true and good. Right? So there's all these different things. Then we get to the last thing. Here's the good thing. We'll end on a good note. When everything is right, God will say, Go. The doors will open, right? God will provide. God will make a way. And we see this over and over and over again throughout God's word of all the stories of those that have gone before us, right? God, when everything is right, God will say, go. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is John, the beloved disciple, one of Jesus' right-hand guys, Right? And, he, and he wrote this, these words. He says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. Now, I just, I, I'm just sure John's just writing this with passion. I want the churches to get this. As he knows this letter is going to be circulated, the first century. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, that's a key phrase. Not according to our will, but according to his will. We're in complete alignment with God, right? It's for his purposes, not just ours, right? When we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Verse 15, and if we know that he hears us, which is his promise, we started with that, called me and I'll answer you. Whatever we ask, we know that we have what we've asked of him because we're going to receive it because it's in accordance to his will. Now, this is why I stress over and over again why it's so important that we spend time with God on a daily basis in his word. Just growing and cultivating our relationship with God. Letting God's promises speak to us. He wants to speak to us, and he speaks to us by his power. He speaks to us through his word, by the spirit of God. And if we, the more time we spend with him, and the more time we're in God's word, the more clear his voice is going to be that we're going to know his will, that we can be in alignment with him, and we'll see the promise of answered prayer over and over again in our lives, right? doesn't mean that we're going to get everything that we want. God's sometimes going to say no. Sometimes God's going to say whoa. Sometimes God's going to say grow. Sometimes God's going to say so. <laughs> Just like parents, right? <laughs> because I said so, right? You know, we, we're not, we don't always have things lined up, but when everything is right, God will say, go, let's do this. 
So what I want to do, I think I have the Lord's prayers in there. It's in there. I just want to take a moment. Let's just go through the Lord's prayer. This is kind of a modern version of the Lord's prayer. And I thought it'd be good if we could just take a moment and pray this prayer together as a church because there's so much power and promise in, in this prayer and what God has in store for us. So let's just, let's just kind of take a moment. We're just going to all say this together and we're just going to be, you know, directing this towards God. Let's, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Amen. It's such a powerful prayer. That God wants to unlock heaven. The word hollow, we were joking during band practice because the song we're going to sing here in just a moment is Your Name is Powered. I said, I thought his name was Howard, right? Because <laughs> as a kid growing up, you know, they say hallowed, you know, you, I don't know, we always make words, it's Howard, right? But it means it's, it's sacred, it's set apart. His name, we are representatives of his name. We're to be holy, set apart. So we have this great Father in heaven whose name is holy, is set apart, and he invites us to come and we're, he's saying, let your kingdom come, let your will be done right here in our midst that we need him to come and give us not our weekly bread, but daily we need him. We need his provision in our life. We need forgiveness of sins. Our relationships matter. Temptation, times of temptation come. We're asking for God's help in that, that he will deliver us from evil from ourselves, from our enemy, from our sin, right? And for his, God is sovereign. His is the kingdom. His is the power. His is the glory. It's all for him. Amen.